views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. As you know, we've been doing all our programs from our homes, and uh, I am in uh, my apartment in the Bronx. Um, this evening, we are doing a very important program. A lot of people have been, um, for want of a better term, freaking out over um, wh what's been going on. And uh, so what we thought we would do is bring two uh, mental health experts to give us some perspective, some point of view, a way that, frankly, mentally, psychologically, we can all get through this. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to uh, welcome in the executive director of Mosaic Mental Health. It is Donna Dimitri Friedman. Nice to have you with us, uh, Dr. Friedman. Uh, you're back on the show. You were with us before. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. We're all in this together. Uh, yes. For good or for bad, we're working as hard as we can. And the assistant executive director of clinical services at Aster Services for Children and Families, it is uh, Dr. Todd Carlin. Dr. Carlin, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having us on. This is such an important topic. I'm so glad we have a chance to discuss. I, I can't think of one person I know or people I don't know who would not think that this is a, a vital thing. Um, let's just start uh, with you, Dr. Friedman, and um, just talk about the, you know what Mosaic does and how you've been able to deliver um, mental health services to, number one, your clients or others who may be showing up in one form or another now. Absolutely. So uh, we are Mosaic Mental Health. We're located in the Northwest Bronx, formerly uh, Riverdale Mental Health Association. And we've been serving the community for over 60 years. Um, and we see people in person. Typically, they come to our services here at uh, Riverdale Avenue. And we also have people in um, housing. We have programs out in the community, helping people transition from the hospital, we have a crisis respite um, service. And so uh, we were one of the first mental health facilities, I think, to really, really um, mobilize and understand how close to home this was because we're located directly across the street from SAR High School. Oh. Uh, where one, I can literally see it out my window. And so we immediately um, began to uh, have our staff um, begin to do teletherapy. Uh, we do have our doors open. I'm actually in my office. Uh, we have to continue to provide certain fundamental administrative things that make it essential to keep the organization running. But many of our therapists are working from home. Some of them are coming in and working from their office here. We are social distancing. We are keeping everyone safe, anyone who's sick stays home and so forth. But um, what we are finding is that our clients are really responding very positively uh, to the telephonic therapy that we are providing for them. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the resources to see them face to face. A lot of our clients and we don't have the capacity computer wise. I'm actually on a cell phone right now because I don't have a camera on my computer. But um, but we are really um, reaching out to people that we uh, don't hear from, uh, not waiting for them to call us uh, because we know that sometimes people um, you know, withdraw. And so we're making sure that we are keeping contact with people and making sure everyone has what they need. We mobilized our board of directors, uh, helped us get food. So all of our people who are in our housing programs are safely at home with food and medication. 
And we reached out to even some of the families that we know who were in need of some additional supplies and were able to supply them. Are you finding that uh, people even uh, who were clients of yours over uh, in the past now have new or additional issues and or are people coming in from the outside with a whole new series of issues, which sure. uh, which we're going to pursue, and also with Dr. Carlin, because there's a lot. Of, I, ma I made a long list, which we're going to go through. But yeah. go ahead, uh, just respond to that. Yeah, so, so um, initially the conversation often starts out with um, issues around uh, what is happening with coronavirus, and we are doing a lot of... Um, educating over the phone, making sure people understand how to take care of themselves in this crisis. Um, people are anxious about their own physical health. People with mental illness uh, have a lot of comorbidities, meaning that they often will have diabetes or asthma or other um, high blood pressure and other kinds of health issues. So um, we usually are starting out with that, but then interestingly, um, the ses sessions move into some of the things that they've been dealing with beforehand. Um, we do have some new folks who are calling us specifically to talk about the coronavirus and how it's impacting them. Um, people are very worried about how they're going to pay their bills, uh, how they're going to keep their uh, families safe. Um, folks are isolated. Uh, if they have elderly family um, so we are guiding them, with, which is what we're going to talk about today, how to stay connected, how to stay positive, how to stay healthy, um, and maybe even have some fun while we're quarantined with people we love. Um, it is possible, and I hope to inspire some of you to feel like you can give yourself permission to do that um, and maybe do some things that you've wanted to do that you haven't had a chance to, and now that you're home, you can. Well, let's bring Dr. Carlin into uh, the dialogue. Um, talk about, uh, I guess, in a similar vein, uh, we'll start off with Aster Services uh, and find out um, where you are, who you are, and what kinds of things you've been dealing with uh, through this crisis. Sure. Uh, Aster also is a mental health agency that's been in the Bronx for, uh, we've been serving families for over 65 years, and in the Bronx for over 45. We have two hub clinics, one at 750 Tilden Street, and another in Highbridge, uh, 1419 Shakespeare Avenue. We have uh, the largest day treatment services in the Bronx, including a therapeutic preschool in East Chester, uh, early school age in East Tremont, and our middle school in Hunts Point Avenue. We also have prevention care management programming and a variety of community programming as well. We touch over 50 public schools through a combination of school-based um, uh, clinics as well as a lot of other consultation services um, and direct services to kids in the communities. So obviously we're very enriched throughout the community and, and uh, the ability to navigate all these services uh, was immediately impacted uh, by the virus uh, and the outbreak. We did a lot of mobilization. Uh, we turned around our hub clinics, our day treatment program and all of our remote clinical services to telehealth in a matter of days so that we were able to stay open, stay connected to our families. We have over 50 clinicians right now who are providing services throughout the Bronx who are now, uh, they are all remote. Uh, like Dr. Friedman, we have a hub location that also has residential services and other things in the Hudson Valley that is our kind of hub base that remains open for administrative functions and some critical functions that need to remain open. But by and large, most of our services have transitioned to telehealth in a short amount of time. Uh, I want to ask a two-part question about the telehealth services. Number one, uh, as effective, nearly as effective, of course, human contact, which we're all going to miss over this period of time, uh, right. is, is vital. And then the second part of it is, I understand from other psychologists I know, uh, there's concern about uh, telehealth being covered or not covered by insurance companies that, you know, they, they kind of require this, you know, because they, they don't want people mailing it in, of course, in this in this day and age, right. you got to do what you can. So let's address both of those, the effectiveness and then, of course, uh, the insurance aspect of it. So there was a that those are great questions um, in terms of the effectiveness. I think we were already kind of one of the things that we were kind of put us in a better place is that we were already doing telepsychiatry and some telehealth services even before the crisis. 
So we had some of the infrastructure and kind of know-how and kind of um, what worked and what didn't even before this all started. I think we know that a lot of our um, middle school and, and high school kids actually really prefer it and they feel for them it's a comfortable form of interaction that kind of matches a lot of the social engagements that they're used to. Sometimes for the parents, uh, it can be a little bit challenging who may not be used to who really want that in-person feel. And of course, there are some challenges sometimes with younger kids in terms of keeping them engaged in sessions and in therapy. And we have to be a really creative and bring in a lot of uh, fun things and other tools and other internet options that are become available to us and become opportunities to telehealth that otherwise we might not be using. Um, I would say there is uh, a good amount of research that does say that a lot of the things that we do do translate well and are effective through telehealth, which is great that there is a research base that supports the work. And thankfully, all the red tape that might have taken a long time to get this up and running has been really kind of a non-issue. Both the state uh, agencies and the federal government have made the allowances necessary to make sure that people can stay vitally connected to services. Um, yes, there is some question about private and commercial insurances about their reimbursement of what they are of what they will allow, but we haven't allowed that to interfere with our outreach, and we're making sure that we're continuing to serve all the people that we need to stay connected with, and we'll sort those issues out a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you the same question, um, so we'll start with you, um, Doctor. The um... Uh, the, the effectiveness of group sessions, do you really run group sessions on Zoom or Hangouts or anything like that? Or are, is that not, uh, are you not able to do that? And then we'll ask Dr. Friedman the same question. Uh, there is the capability of it. Um, the, the, you know, you can have multiple people log in. I think we're navigating all the things that go into it, the HIPAA issues of having parents of other kids also being there in sessions oh. um, and, and those types of concerns. Um, but we are running some, some therapeutic milieus, both through our, our day treatment and our partial hospitalization program. Um, I think for the kids, uh, they, they, they miss being in school. They miss their peers. They miss their friends. You know, school holiday sounded really great until actually the isolation set in, and now people want to go back. So I, we see the group sessions, which are just beginning to start, as a vital way for these kids to stay connected moving forward. Well, that that's uh, fascinating. Actually, I got a, um, a a photograph from a cousin who lives in another city of a, uh, her seven year old granddaughter sitting with the iPad in front of her playing. Where well, I'm a boy, so I don't know. But whatever girls do, they were playing with their hair things or their design things, and they were playing it together on the uh, internet. Tragic in a way, but beautiful in another way that they just have that need to connect. So, Dr. Friedman, uh, really the same question for you about well, group sessions. So, we, we um, just to back up a, for a moment, we, we had not been doing any telehealth. So, we had to start from scratch. Um, and that was a, a fault order, but we've, we've overcome some of the technological barriers to that. One of the things I want to point out that's really important is that a lot of the clients that we serve, and let's not forget that the Bronx, 59% of Bronx residents are Medicaid recipients, which means they live below the poverty line. We, um, not everybody has the, techno the technological resources to actually um, interface with us in ways that would be um, more of a human touch. So the idea of getting people on Zoom, getting people on Hangouts um, has been a challenge. And um, the old fashioned telephone at the moment has been our mode of communication. As uh -huh. we look to the next weeks and months of doing this, we will, I'm sure, get more sophisticated and more adept at doing things that are more collaborative, more, um, you know, uh, able to have group kinds of activities. Um, and we, as this unfolds, we are working very closely with the state to redeploy staff from programs where the services we were provided just put everyone at too much risk and reusing those folks and the spaces and so forth to provide other very needed um, aspects of the work. For example, if somebody's been in a psychiatric hospital, um, those beds are becoming precious commodities 
in the hospitals. And so if they are ready to be released, we are um, looking at moving them into one of our residential programs that has been closed because the services um, were not deemed uh, essential services at this time. So it's a, it's a work in progress. I would say that one of the most important things um, about this is that we need to be flexible. And it's one of the things that I've been really proud of my staff uh, about because people are thinking out of the box, they're being flexible, they're stepping up and they're basically saying whatever it takes, keep us safe, keep us fed. Um, our board's been sending food for those of us who've been coming into the office. These things are important. Um, and the, the other piece of this, of course, is uh, when we start to think about the longer term aspect of being isolated, um, we, we must take that step to show other people how to stay connected. Um, it's, it's, we're very lucky that we have this technology now for all the criticisms and all the concerns that we've had about screen time and so forth. Um, this is a way that we can see each other's faces, smile, make each other laugh, um, and also be there to support one another. Um, I literally was able to, my dad's in the hospital and, um, my stepmom was let in to go see him. Um, and I was able to, I called her on her cell phone and I was able to FaceTime with my 86 year old dad, who's very, very, wow. and so, um, I'm, you know, we're all, we're all finding new ways to be there for one another. So let, let me, uh, uh, Look, I, I made a list and I was just thinking not, not only of uh, everybody out there, but even of myself and how we're all feeling. And, and we'll give each of you a chance to, uh, uh, Dr. Kalen, we'll start with you. People are scared and frightened because this is, we, we know why they're scared because, and, and there's an insidious element to this that you don't know. I mean, you touch the pole in the subway, right. you pick up a container of milk in the store. For all you know, this creepy thing is on it. Right. People are feeling cooped up. Their routines have been disrupted, uh, disrupted. People who are not used to living in close proximity are living in, you know, roommates who just are roommates casually. Now they're family because they are literally cooped up together. Uh, people who don't live with other people are now completely isolated. That could include senior citizens. I mean, we would make a, we could make a long list of yes. who um, would be in that situation. And this, of course, opens up a whole range of stuff. The financial considerations. Uh, the latest number was, uh, or the, you know, I saw a number that said the potential that 30 percent of America will be out of work. As a result of this, uh, and, and every one of those people, even if they say, well, I'm not the only one, they're looking at their own bottom line and saying, you know, the rent is due on, on April 1st. What am I going to do? Um, uh, concern about your children. The children are now <laughs> in the house running loose. You're trying to keep them on, in school and all that. You're concerned about teens who have this different sort of energy. I mean, this is a very long list. Um, Dr. Kalen, um, where do, where do you want to uh, start? Excuse me, Carlin, where do you want to start uh, to, to look at this and to reach out to people and say, this is what you ought to be thinking about, or this is how you should look at this? Well, I think it's, you brought up so many issues and so many stressors. And I, th and I think you hit upon the key point is that everyone is stressed out in the situation. So we talk you know, we talk about the focus of kids' mental health and making sure that we can support them. But before we even begin to support them, we have to make sure that the parents going through all that list of things that you were mentioning are before they even engage in a conversation and working with them, that they can find a calm moment to actually have that conversation and feeling grounded themselves. Uh, because they're what, what they really are trying to do is present a sense of normalcy, control, and routine to kind of support their kids so that even when a lot of the external things are kind of going out of control and, and that, that it's sort of, I can keep you safe. We have things that are set up to do that. The world will still make sense, even if they're going to make sense within our walls, um, and that we can do things to make it safer for you and for family, because that really does create the sense of support normalcy to reduce anxiety and to prevent more of those mental health issues and concerns that really could get really exacerbated by this situation. I, I want to I want to just jump in about that. So um, and, and real real advice for parents. So parents 
Try not to scare the kids. You're scared. Right. We know that. Right. Don't lie to them, right? right? I mean, you certainly don't want to say everything is wonderful and then the kids will find out maybe it's not. Right. And then if you have real deep concerns about, you know, your, your frailties, your financial frailties or other things that you are concerned about, you, uh, mother or father or whomever, keep that to yourselves and, and keep a sense of comfort for the children. Uh, yeah, you wanna, am I reading you right there? Yeah, you want to scale the information to be developmentally appropriate to the kids and what they're able to hear. You want to be able to answer questions honestly. You also don't want to present that you're afraid or that this is something that we can't talk about it. You certainly want also to make so that, sure, we can talk about it. And I'm going to check in with you from time to time to see how you're doing, because this is something that's OK to talk about. If kids feel that adults aren't okay to have a conversation, then they will begin to think that it's even worse than it is. Right. Uh, um, and, and then one, one other thing I want to, I want, I want to stay with this, and we're going to let Dr. Friedman weigh in also about, about parents and children. And then the next thing to do would be activities of some sort to distract, I'm, I'm guessing creative activities, whether it's paint a picture, make a thing, talk into a microphone, say how, you know what I mean? Do something creative that lets you express I'm like a two-step process of how to really work with the kids. Of course, schoolwork yeah. couldn't hurt either. Right. I mean, I think having I think it's so important to have a routine, even and establish a routine, even if this is the, you know, the new normal. Uh, I always think of Mr. Rogers, you know, Mr. Rogers came in to the house. He put the sweater on and when the sweater came up and the sneakers came on, it was playtime. And I think what a lot of uh, families are struggling with right now is everything blending together. And it's hard to separate out when is school, when is work, when is chores, when is bed, when is dinner. So just trying to keep up that sense of normalcy through those steps is really helpful. And I think uh, you hit upon a, a real key point about fun activities. I think you want to also through a stressful day and everything, you know, pick activities that are going to be extremely reinforcing and easy and that everybody's going to enjoy. If, uh, if you know, if, if you know that coloring and, and beads and other things are going to be fun and easy for everyone versus maybe the finger paints that could get everywhere that's going to be also really <laughs> stressful, that might not be the time for it when you've just done 10 hours of remote school and trying to get through a day and get everybody doing what they need to do. I, I think uh, what you say uh, fits right in with what, an article that was in the Times, I believe, yesterday, where a woman said, you know, I'm mom, but at 9 a.m. we have a rule now, I'm teacher Anita, and they should address me as the teacher, so they get to, to play out that role. The other thing I thought was adorable in that same article is the um, uh, uh, one of the parents said, we went to the dinner table and we had everybody at the dinner table imitate somebody else in the family, so they went around and one was mom and one was dad and one was the you know, and, and I mean, it became challenging, but I thought it was a, a creative way of just being together. Anyway, Dr. Friedman, did you want to add in? I'm sure yes. you do about the kids thing. Sure. So um, it's interesting. Last night, I actually taught a class on Skype uh, at the 92nd Street Y called Becoming Parents. And I had a bunch of expect expectant parents, very anxious about um, bringing babies into this new world. And what I said to them, and I believe this very strongly, is that for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, people have been parenting and creating interesting, fun ways of staying connected. And we are now a society that relies a great deal on other people and other things to entertain us and to scaffold and structure us. And so, you know, my suggestion is call your grandparents call your parents and ask older folks who lived in a simpler time, quite frankly, who really enjoyed their, you know, I'm Sunday meals with the family, Shabbat dinner, um, you know, Saturdays, just, you know, being home and watching cartoons. Um, we don't have to make such a production out of this um, so much as to stick with a routine, make your bed, Make sure that you get dressed. Make sure that you differentiate between different aspects of the day. Um, I was, I've been working around the clock, but every morning I've been getting up and making my bed and making sure the dishes are done because it gives me a sense of my life is still my life and I'm going to get through this. So, you know, creating those things, having a chart saying, okay, this is snack time. Um, 
the other thing I think that's uh, really important, and someone mentioned this the other day, is, you know, children really need to learn some of the basics of life. Show them your checkbook. Don't necessarily talk about the finances, but you know, how to write. I used to make a living. Yes. Show them, show them how to wash the um, wash clothes. I mean, you can, you know, create a create a store, create a restaurant. I have a, a, a beloved godson who who will, you know, takes. He's he's the um, he's the waiter. You know, he oh, was. Um, I, w I want to um, I want to. Uh, uh, and move this up because we, we are going to we can talk about this. You guys yeah. do this all day. Um, let's talk about teens. Now, teens who yes. are in the house, uh, they are a handful when we don't have this very difficult problem. Uh, and let's be a little bit briefer because we want to make it want to give sure. everybody a chance. And then I want to move to adults and how we're feeling. But so right. go ahead. So I, I would say that teenagers actually probably um, know how to do this better than any of us. They have their own uh, sort of way of communicating with one another. They're often in their rooms talking to one another on Snapchat and all these other platforms. Um, now they've got a structure to do their work. I think what's really important is to um, to ask them what they need. Um, you know, they're in a, a developmental stage where they need their independence. They need their space. They're not getting that in quite the same way. And so engage your teenager in what it is that they need from you at this time. And you will be surprised how smart and clever and interesting their solutions can be. Um, and, and, you know, treat them like the young adults that they are becoming and, and ask a little more of them. And I think that they will feel um, supported and helped by that. Um, uh, let, let me bring Dr. Carlin in so we don't run out of time. Did you want to weigh in about the teenagers as well? No, I, I certainly agree. And I, I think that one of the things that we know is especially, and I just want to touch on, you know, a lot of people who um, are already accessing services and especially for the teens who have a lot of coping skills and strategies and safety plans and things like that that support them. We just want to make sure that as you know, um, they do uh, certainly a lot of things online and socially, but there are also other activities and things that may be missing from their lives. And we want to make sure either through parents or through connecting them through uh, their providers and making sure that they're able to access their school supports, their people, that they're staying connected to all the people they need to be connected to. And that if there's anything in their normal support structure that's missing, problem solving with them about what could be those replacement things for them during this time. Uh, um, they can also be one of our more vulnerable groups too. Dr. Carlin, let's talk about adults. Um, you know, I know even for myself, you're always concerned you might catch it. Doesn't matter how old you are. We've seen the stories of people who are younger, who were just frankly taken from us very quickly. Sure. So there's that fear, the financial fears, uh, you know, paying the rent. Um, and, and all right, so you're managing your family, even if you live alone, uh, and you're going, wait a minute, this is, I've ne never seen anything like this. W what should you be thinking about? How can you keep yourself going? Well, I think it's about trying to, it's a, it's a combination of things. I think we all have to do our reality testing and when we have to unplug from the information, uh, it can overflow us. Uh, even when we're looking at just the factual data, we do need to make sure that we build into that routine and that schedule some time away to decompress. And whether that's through doing the things that we like and we care about, uh, there are a lot of great apps and mindfulness and other things to kind of help ground us and do activities so that we can calm our own thoughts. And knowing that a certain amount of anxiety and worry is natural and to be expected during this time to allow ourselves for that and to not catastrophize that. But at the same time, knowing that if those become persistent and that we're having trouble and they're really we're, we're really not able to navigate it and it's really causing interference to make sure that people are able to access services uh, and that would include aster and of course yeah uh, we, we primarily well. we primarily treat um uh, children and adolescents but of course families because you can't work with kids and adolescents without families we have our own hotline set up for this during this time which is one eight six six aster zero one that's 866-278-6701. Um, and if you, we can connect you to you know, the right service maybe, and make sure that people get maybe maybe in, that case, maybe in that case, the right service could be at Mosaic and she could do the same thing. Uh, yeah. and, and we've done a lot of cross referrals because 
sometimes it's the it's people who need in person or they need a certain connection or it's it's really about trying especially now with with all the of the opportunities in front of us to make sure people are getting uh, getting the right connection for both themselves and for other family members. Okay, Dr. Friedman, you get the, the final word. You got about 45 sure. seconds. So, I, I think that um, one of the most important things is to not watch too much news. Um, it's very overwhelming. I think we are hungry for information and we are being very overwhelmed by it. Um, and to, to give yourself time. Uh, the parents and adults uh, who are running, you know, household and, and the family really need time. And so find a space and time to, you know, it might be listening to music while taking a shower. It might be, you know, uh, spending a little time exercising in your own home. Whatever you can do to clear your own mind and to breathe um, and to really sort of take a step back. Um, there are a number of things that are going to be coming our way financially to, to support people who are struggling. Um, we have a vocational team here in addition to therapists. Um, you know, please give us um, a Dr. call. Freeman, give, us, yeah, give, us a, give us a phone number and because and, uh, then we got to go. Yes, it's 718-796-5300, Mosaic Mental Health. And we're here to help. And um, we'll talk you through it. And even if it's once a, a one-time phone call, we're here to um, support you. Listen, uh, we can't thank you enough. Uh, you, you folks are also on the front lines. We talk about our first responders. Uh, we're, we're all going nuts here. Boy, I sure wish we had the baseball season. I would, I would feel a heck of a lot better if I could turn on the game every night. I can tell you that. No. Um, anyway, um, uh, Executive Director of Mosaic Mental Health, Donna Dimitri Friedman. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. And the Assistant ED of Clinical Services at Aster Services for Children and Families, Dr. Todd Carlin. Thank you so much for everything you do. We'll probably check in. I may call you. You never know. Yes, Things are getting yes, pretty nice crazy. Tip. Folks, Thank we'll you. see you next week for Bronx Talk. Next week, we're going to talk about not-for-profits in the Bronx and how they are doing. It's a very complicated issue, and they, of course, are important to our lives. Thanks to Helen. Thanks to Carl, who set this up. Thanks to Michael Max. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to the two uh, folks who guested with us. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye.